Sorry, Hello time. everyone and welcome Plus to the Gate 19 Human Design Catalyst. We're just going to get settled and uh, start in about 10 or 15 minutes. Say hi to the, the po folks. We have a little hey, hello and we have a little we have a doggy here. Oh, everyone gets everything. Oh, Leo, you also, you. Oh, sweet. Okay, well, we'll just get it going. So if it's New Year's, Chinese New Year, it's uh, Moon. Oh, it's a New Year, it's a New Year. I have Moon in 19. I was born on New Year's Eve. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. I think the Moon just moved into 13, too. Oh, really? I think so. Yeah. Moon. moon is so fast. Yeah. It's so quick. Yeah. Because yeah. my son's in 41. So your son's in 41? So by the time I was born, Well, I guess because I was so far, I was on the Pacific Coast. So, lunar's, it would have changed the lunar's day. Anyway, yeah. 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 I was just like backwards engineering the like time zone situation. Because <laughs> uh, the day is considered secular in the lunar's eve, but if the moon had already passed the point of precise conjunction with the sun, then it would be lunar's day already. Or it was Somebody. Hello, hello. It's there. Hi. Hi. What do you get? I got some ginger beer. Oh, I was. I got three extras. <laughs> hey. Did you just say something about that? Yeah, you did. <laughs> wow. So good to see you. Yeah. This is Jinx. Jinx. Hey, we're back. We're back. What's the name again? Lindsay. Lindsay. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh no, it's still in 19. I thought it was in there. Okay. Uh, so we're we're in it. 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 I think they're the only ones of these that I actually like. I agree. This is the best one by far. Really? Yeah, whacked yeah, a chair. Yeah, I got it. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. Cards? Alright. Anyway, I'm just going to use this. Yeah. I don't know if that helps. That would be great. But I didn't want it on the yeah, books. Oh, I'm sure. I have seen it. I've seen other people posting and stuff. Yeah. What are they, what are they based on? Well, initially, they initially they're based on the Don't burn yourself, girl. I was just reading something about mapping, and you were just telling me about this, Jonah, but I read something about mapping the tarot, the major arcana, to a bunch of different dates. Yeah, I, I saw think, something online about that. There's definitely, um, people have tried, you know, everyone loves making these correspondences. Maybe later, if we have time, we're going to get to a little global cycle stuff. That's but right. one of the funniest ones is, um, there's a guy, Richard Mason, you know Richard Mason? Okay, anyone? You know Richard Mason. You know Richard oh, Mason. Yeah. yeah. So he has. So Mike has the sixty-one. Which line of sixty-one do you have? Fifty-one. Um, okay. Well, I'm not going to think about it because I have no content. I don't want to. The last one. <laughs> yeah. So basically, what you go, Rich? I sixty-one six. Okay. So what's interesting is sixty-one one is the current cycle key, and because it's the current cycle key. Basically, you can go back to the previous cycle of 612. You can go back to the previous. It's because it's not just the cost of planning, it's also the cost of Maya. It's actually those eight keys. Mm -hmm. So there's the four keys for the cost of planning, plus the four keys for the cost of Maya, which includes 861. So anyway, you can go back to 612. That's an era from 1890 to 1960. You can go from 1820 
1890, that was when 1603 was the key. And what's funny is Richard Mason has that for yours, are probably the key from the late 1600s, early 1700s. Like, in, what's funny is if you have one of these keys, you can actually see this anachronistic thing where you have a, a love of a certain era or of a certain time period, and particularly in 61, of the mysticism of that same time period as an explanation for history. It's the key for gate, uh, so as the key for gate 13, it's, it's related to our past and to our history, like that, and how we understand our history, the stories we tell about our history. So, you know, some of the 1601 has the most contemporary kind of stories we tell. They have the key to really explain it the way we can with this contemporary way, getting to the bottom of it, getting to the final revelation of it all, occult knowledge, pulling back the curtain, everything. Um, let's put this, uh, you know, it's going to be really loud next to the microphone if you, if you keep doing that, because there were complaints last time about the audio, oh, yeah, so we're going to have to check. No, it's okay, we're just going to have to see how it is. I thought it was just pretty. It, it, it is pretty, too. We're it's just going to have to pretty. see. I mean, you can put it on this. It's a completely <laughs> valid place. It is. But um, hopefully, hey, hey, Jen. Uh, hey, Katarina Kusk. Hi, Joe Phil Projector. All right. We'll be starting in just a couple minutes here. We're just doing a little bit of a pre, pre taught, you know, pre catalyst hang appetizer. Yeah. Keep us hanging out. But um, yeah, so what's interesting is when you have like the older ones, though, like Richard Mason has 61 and 3. And so one of the first things I noticed when I looked at the research he was doing, Design, and this gets to the people who really are trying to associate with tarot cards and so on. He has the key from 1820 to 1890, roughly. Well, what was going on then? The Esophical Society, OTO, I mean, um, Golden Dawn, I guess, you know, 1820 stuff. Like, you see when it really started to kick in in the beginning of the 1800s, Alistair Crowley, all that stuff. We're really seeing this huge heyday of spiritualism and of all this interest, and what they were doing was making a system where everything corresponds to everything. It's interesting, James Hillman had a great point where he kind of criticizes the idea of trying to say that the four seasons have to correspond to the four temperaments. He says, let the fours be different. Just because there's fours doesn't mean you can flatten them off the same thing. There was an obsession. It was in vogue for a period of time in the 1800s. Well, what do you find when you look at Mason's work? He has a spirit animal for every single one. This is the eagle and this is that. And he has a day of the week for each one or a time of the day of the week or everything. I mean, he has the correspondences down to the minutia level. And I think it's because of the 61.3. I think it's a little bit of his. And that was a sort of an evolutionary moment a couple hundred years ago. But it's, I think roughly 1890. Yeah, so that was a very, I mean, and it kind of ushered in, obviously, Neptune's discovery. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so anthro 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 and uh, if we have time later, you know, we have copies of the complete AV chain here. We can do a little bit of analysis, yeah. But so wouldn't that, because you, so you said like OTO and uh, Golden Dawn and all that stuff, wouldn't that also be line two then? Would you said it was 1900s more than 1800s? Yeah. Well, what were the time periods? I, I thought it all emerged in the early 1800s. Yeah, I think, well, I think I think of Manly Hall as like introducing those people to that kind of stuff. And he was Whoa. writing in like the 10s and 20s. Okay, when was, maybe, it, maybe, it, maybe, I don't know, I'm just you can look up, if you ever found, maybe you can look up when the OTO was founded, or not even OTO, but, but maybe you can look up Golden Dawn and OTO and they were founded, because so that would be, that would be cool, so. I, I love the 61, chick, doing that on cycles and seeing the different types of the, like, unknown mystical information for each of those periods is really cool. Well, right, and you can do it with, with all of the gates and all the lines, and that, that's something we can do later by looking at the first lines um, from, you know, if we have time, we can do first lines from Cross of Maya and so on. But, okay, I think we're ready to begin. We have enough people here. We're, we're ready to get started. Um, we're going to, uh, so we're kind of starting each week now. Thanks for joining. We're going to be looking at the journey around the wheel. So the journey around the wheel is actually a, um, this is actually going to be a, 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 oops, 
Yeah, I guess I also did have a scene that rolled it off somehow. Uh, yeah, why don't you tell us about it? Uh, well, this week it's uh, covering date 19, so that's you know, the date that comes after 40, 41, which we looked at last week. And um, again, just like kind of seeing out the details, I, mean, I can't read them off the top of my head, but talking about how you know, it's a root to emotional center date, like so it has root fuel. And that fuel is um, to know what's needed. It's a root center date. Yeah. Not an emotional center. It's pointed at the emotional center. I didn't, I didn't say that. I said it was a, like a root to emotional center. And uh, yeah, so like the, the knowing to what's needed or not. Um, and so this is a tribal gate that just has a lot of. I don't know if intuition definitely came up for me, but uh, maybe it definitely is a sensitivity to the needs of those around them. Um, and it's associated with touch and just kind of this real, you know, it feels very earthy and it's connected to a nature and animals as well. And so, um, so it's interesting to, to observe that throughout my week. Um, I encountered a couple dogs. We have a dog here tonight. Um, and I don't know. I've definitely felt like a yearning for like that animal comfort. Um, Mike, you had an observation this week. That animals are friendlier and yeah. easier and more affectionate. Yeah. yeah. I've seen a lot of animals like that this week. My own cat was, was the one I spent the most time around. Mm -hmm. I definitely see that. It's funny that it's the gate of flirtation and then also associated, well, I mean, with a number of, I mean, it's, uh, we were joking in our, you know, human design, we were going to do a, you know, human design after dark, gate 19, and, you know, anal sex was going to be our joke, because the 19 is actually, uh, the gate of the prostate. Yeah, right? it's the gate of the prostate for men, for men, I mean, obviously, like, for men, uh, because they don't have that biology, but it does, um, associate even just to the tailbone region into that kind of like for animals like floating mm -hmm. animals have their crystals i love that their crystals are like a different configuration <laughs> right right yeah i literally just read that little meme you had which is uh there. which is that they actually do have a um, you know what they're they they kind of i guess the glands around the tailbone and all that area is is really their uh their personality some sense and they express their personality through scent and through other glands or excretions we don't fully understand in mean, these are mammals and uh and then they're so yeah isn't it their personality crystal is there and their design crystal is well, where's the design crystal again is it, I, don't know. I think it's in their head i think the design crystal is like the head of the face so the design crystal is kind of the thing that's it's a different Leading. orientation yeah. they're being led with their design crystal mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're, they're checking out the personality. You know, dogs probably have 100,000. It's like email. You can email any different address. And if you didn't know what email was, it would just look like it's the same thing. But you see that each address has different letters in it. Well, dogs probably have 100,000 different smells. They can mm -hmm. differentiate a million different smells the same way. You can easily differentiate a million different email addresses. You mm -hmm. know, it's language. We know the language. But we don't understand that language. So us, it just sounds the same. It's, we don't have a language of smell in that way. Mm -hmm. That's what comes to an immediate time. Right, like the other noodle around, he starts sniffing butts. And that's it's, right, and yeah. it's face to face for it's them face in some sense. I mean, yeah, weirdly, it's or it's personality to personality, well, and or it's design to personality. And it's how they, instantaneous. Yeah. They have a reaction instantaneous to that dog that they're meeting. Just mm -hmm. like, like I was just at the dog park with him earlier, and it's like he comes up to some dogs and like he's like sniffing, and they're like, "Wait, do we play? Do we play?" Yes, and it's like it happens so fast. Then other dogs, it's like, "Oh no, I don't like that smell," and they don't play together. Like it's. It's yeah, instant. It so, really is a, a deep connection. And they can recognize each other too. Like dogs that only see there, like they'll like we'll see that dog again and he'll be like, Oh and they start romping like they were before. So there's recognition to like memory. It's it's amazing how even if even though some mammals do have very developed by five centered standards vision. That vision is really was not the evolutionary project for the five-centered creature. It's probably not the project for any creature of the same-centered. 
in the molecular vision, starting with the left side of the Ajna binary, or the, the third color, third process, and so on, really with the seven-centered being and trying to kind of be the perfect apex predator, that required visual. And there's a really beautiful poetic part in Lucky Fuller's The Synergetics, where he talks about the end of the great pirates. And he actually says it's the end of the 1800s. It was going into that line, too. And he says that was the time when things became invisible. They went invisible. And until that point, the human project is becoming the apex predator, developing vision better than any other vision, developing the ability to detect and pattern detection and plan and all this. And at a certain point, though, the physical acuity and, I mean, long before that, the, the great pirates took over because they were the ones who essentially were able to play countries against each other. He called them the great pirates, but he really just meant sea cutting people, kind of high tech, cutting edge. And but it was really their, their eventual downfall was that everything in really the seven-centered world depended on this monitoring, depended on this society of domination. And it's like how Foucault said we're moving to a society of control. It's more ephemeral. It's different. It's not like domination. It's not a visual component. It's not like the seven-centered being that had its visual acuity. It's more about the invisible now, really. Just kind of an interesting point is we've moved beyond the seven centered paradigm, and uh, it's almost there's so many conspiracy theorists out there who believe that shadowy people are in control, and it's almost a cold comfort compared to the nine centered reality of there not being something in control, of it actually being these these new forms that are ultimately a new world that's not even being created for us; it's being created for a new being. Which, by the way, I believe wasn't it last year that the the people were being born that will give birth to the first generation of rays. Just last year, as part of the, mm -hmm. the cycles. It, it was only really when, when this set of Pluto-Neptune transits over the next 39 years to the human experiential way, that we were talking about last week, that got kicked off last year. And it's only once that started, which, you know, after 39 years, the combination of Neptune you know, washing everything away and Pluto reinventing it, the world's not really going to be recognizable. It's not just 2027 that's coming, it's back to back Pluto, sat, or sorry, Pluto, Neptune, transits to the human experience away to those four gates, gate 41, 30, 36, 35. So if you have, like, you have 36, and you know, anyone who has any gates in that, you're about to have some Pluto, Neptune sometime in the next 40 years, depending where you are in that. Uh, and, and you will be experiencing it as the world will. And so on, so. But as far as, yeah, just, you know, mammalian, the mammals have such a world held sense of smell. The humans, the seven center, developed with vision. Now we're really on this precipice with this new era that's emerging of based on electricity, based on the invisible, based on the ephemeral, based on all of these things. Do you find something good in there? Yeah. Well, I just I just wanted to kind of touch about like the, the roots in the, the I Ching and how um, in the I Ching this gate is uh, called approach. And uh, the keynote for that is that all things that are that are interrelated is apparent and manifested through the action of approach. Um, and yeah, it's really interesting like looking at Again here in the, the journey from the first line to the sixth line, so it really kind of shows a lot of that um, <clears throat> tribalism, you know, it goes from interdependence <coughs> to service to dedication to the team player and to sacrifice, which is, is where we are today. It's a fifth line there. And what I know about this one um, is like, and you know, we were talking about that this, this weekend. Um, Clara is um, the, the sacrifice of like kind of like knowing what the needs are and you know being like okay I'm not going to put you up there and then, you know tend to the to the needs um, and then the sixth line is the direct directives so it's just kind of interesting seeing that that progression happen. Yeah, I like the sixth line because I always think the sixth line is like always willing to do everything in those lines. As long as it actually assures 
like a change in that energy, right? Mm-hmm. So kind of like mm-hmm. it's like doing oh. it just to get it over with or to get past yeah. it, <laughs> but, like, but never, never waiting until the moment that that something could actually happen. So like they they're not going to waste time relating with people, approaching people, approaching things unless it's going to be the the thing that's like perfectly sort of correct for them. You know? Yeah, you brought that up just the other day. It was really nice. Tay and I had a nice talk and brought up the six line reluctance to do it unless you can do it right, unless you really make a difference. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. I was saying, put some stuff on Audible, put some audiobooks out. It's like, well, yeah, when it's when it's ready, when it's to, to really hit it or something. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, and, and you are the six line, you're a two four, so that's also the specificity of that, but you have six lines. Mm-hmm. Right? I think you're talking in that context. Yeah, yeah. The six line being like, the more it's like waiting until that flower. You don't want to, mm-hmm. you know, you, you want it to really be the flower. And I think that's part of it is that so many six lines use that as part of their con game is just keep waiting, just keep waiting. And they, they hope it's like if they keep waiting, they'll never have to do it. But then they actually <laughs> get pulled down off the roof because this isn't the seven center time anymore. They can't just, you know, stay there. That, that was the, that was really mind blowing to me. It made so much sense. My dad's a six too. And I've, I've done a lot of six lines and it made so much sense to me. Your dad's a six too. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I um, I remember hearing Ross say, because I bet all about the sixth line, and they come down off the roof, and I was like, okay, great. Then I, then I heard him say, well, okay, for the seven centered, they just got on the roof. And that was it. And I'm like, huh, okay, so mm-hmm. for like 90,000 years, the ideal was like, so that's where all the hypocrite stuff comes from. Now I see where all, they got six times is one of the lines of hypocrisy. I mean, mm-hmm. it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It should be the line of authenticity. It should be the line of absolute trustworthiness. It should be the line that will never be a hypocrite ever, but it's that the whole seven center dream and the dream of a lot of people still is to get on the roof and stay there. And it's like, I want to be, I don't want to work for someone who's going to be the boss. I just, I just want to get there so that I can be above it and administrate and never have to be pulled down, never have to be involved again, be in my safe place. Mm-hmm. And I, I see that. And, uh, you know, you'll oftentimes, I actually have a, a a friend who's a six lion in, uh, in their forties, and we're talking about the simultaneous comfort of the roof, plus the desire for the soulmate, and the soulmate being like, "Well, can't I have a soulmate on the roof?" You know, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, "No, you can't. You have to come down off the roof to get your soulmate because when you're on the roof, you know the way Rob put it is when the six lion's on the roof. That's a good twenty years of their life. Um, you know, it's fine. You can love them. You can be with them. Just don't expect them to be there. You're loving someone who's not actually there." They're not actually really present for you. They might say they're present for you. They might go through the motions of being present for you. But when you're wanting someone to actually go through and experience what you're experiencing, they're not because they've already done that through their 20s. They've decided that they're going to, or not even decided, they've had the joyous relief of going, oh my God, I somehow made it. I can get out of here. I can get out of here. I'm never going back to that ever. You could not pay me enough to go back to that. So you're sitting there saying, I have money problems. No. You can date a six line on the roof, don't bring up money problems. You're sitting there saying, hey, I X is in town. No. You can date a six line on the roof, don't tell them about, you know, it's compartmentalized. It is, and I, I'm sorry, it sounds brutal. And I, I've talked to a lot of six lines about this, and they say it sounds mean. But the <laughs> fact is, I thought being mean is being realistic because some people, that works great. Some people, if you're aware of what you're getting into, that's great. But if you're a single parent and you're expecting your six line on the roof partner to, like, really understand what it's like, or you're going through all this stuff. They are compartmentalized with you. You are having an experience with them. You get to, I mean, you have this, Mike, as a, a triple split where it's absolutely necessary for your design to be in different auras. Mm-hmm. And as a sixth line, if you were making the bond in the way that a third line does, mm-hmm. that friction of making and breaking the bond would be throwing your life into absolute chaos as it did through your 20s. Mm-hmm. And the sixth line finally gets to the point where they go, I don't want to deal with that chaos. You know, I don't want to make and break the bond. I'm just going to keep it just right here, just in a nice <laughs> enough distance where we have enough of a bond, we're not really making it too much, we're not really breaking it too much, we're just keeping it right there. It's totally fine, you know? And it's because what they, it gives them the green space. Well, sorry, for the six line unconscious, this can be a shock because then it's like, yeah, I know, for the four six, the four six, it can be a shock because you don't necessarily know where your design It's kind of like you have this, your, your know, it's your odd bedfellow or something. You know? I consider myself a fifth line. I just have this first line person who's constantly trying to get secure foundations, right? <laughs> the fourth line wants to be your friend, they just have the sixth line who goes, I made it, I don't have to, I don't have to be 
present anymore, or not even, I don't even present like mentally, I mean like, yeah, being engaged, it's, there's a certain aloofness or a certain distance of just not having skin in the game, not risking yourself. Like, mm. like here's what I say is like, date six lines on the roof, but don't, or marry them even, but don't expect, you know, don't do money problems, don't do emotional problems, or the deep kind of stuff of going through old relationships, or new or this, just keep it all very six line roof, that's all they want, it's like the good life, like, like vacations and like making money and like having all the like six okay, line roof is very comfortable. Wait, 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 okay, yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> so how does it work with the six line unconscious and the six line conscious then? I mean, same age. They're okay. both very. They're. I mean, well, okay. So the thing is, they're both like going to essentially be the, the unconscious is really its own personality or the personality is its own design. They have different. I mean, I guess one of them is an ephemeral. Uh, you know, it's an interesting question of how they really do differ. To me, like, the biggest differences are actually that we're just talking about right angle and left angle. You can look at a lot of it through that lens. However, I will also say, in my experience, people often know all about their personality profile. Like, I've met so many fifth lines who know how to build the trust, but they might not have put in the 10,000 hours that the first line needs. And part of them is deeply insecure and freaked out, but if they're not in touch with that, they're not going to realize why, and they're just going to be a total mess. And then they like do a shamanic, psychedelic experience, or they do have a kind of Jungian experience, or they go through some inner work or something, and they're face-to-face -face with the unconscious, and they go, oh my God, this is why my idea of myself is nothing like who I really am. For instance, five lines are very monogamous. You know why? Because the first line takes forever to trust somebody. It takes so long to build its solid trust and it's so practical to just take a long time with somebody. But you know how many five ones out there are not monogamous, are not having, you know what I mean? And they're just completely causing all this chaos because the fifth line is the ultimate seducer. There's a great Richard Brodigan quote for the fifth line personalities out there. And I don't know his profile, I wish I knew that one, but uh, just because someone loves your mind doesn't mean you have to give them your body. And that's a, <laughs> that is a Richard Brodigan quote, which I think is very appropriate for five ones. You know, Ra himself talked about how people are sitting in there in the audience thinking he's seducing them personally. Mm -hmm. And then after, they walk up to him and say, hey, and he goes, nothing, no, nothing to do with that. Was, yeah. I mean, this is the personality. The Pretty much weren't there. Actually. Yeah, like, I had no idea you were just, but, no, but, but that's just what the fifth line does. It's the projection field that puts it out there. And, I mean, those four, three, fives, you know, they're, they're ultimate, you know, what did I do? They're, they're, they're ultimate. <laughs> About, about the six line too, I was thinking that the only two left right angle crosses with six lines, or the right angle profiles are the three six and the four six, and then all the rest are in the upper. And it doesn't really make sense, very much sense for a six line to be, I don't know, there's like, there's very few times that it's actually in the unconscious. Well, it's yeah. only, right, there's only four six lines. It really, but then because they go through the third line phase, the third line kind of ends up getting like extra emphasis and profile, which is just kind of funny. Um, and then you really do see that the, the third and sixth lines are kind of fundamental. They're the fundamental, in a, in a certain way, the, the mutative fundamental. They're the fundamental of the design. Because mm -hmm. we always start at the one, because we're just very personality, one, three. But if really, hey, the first profile starts at the three. Mm -hmm. If we're talking at the design level, it all begins with the three, the three dovetails it. And, the, and because the sixes go through three phases, mm -hmm. this is why you start to get to really deep levels of how the third line is all about the builders of the Maya and the, the material. And really, you start with the one, three, you end with the six, three, and you're dovetailed onto the juxtaposition with the four, six, which goes through its third line phase. And I so, think about the third line as the, the one who bumps into the mutations constantly. Right. And the sixth line, the one who's invested in actually making sure those mutations land. You know, they're not going to open their mouth until they, they do, if they're bringing mutated material. So yeah, that's a great way of explaining it. And that's what, yeah, I was saying, do the book. And they're like, well, yeah, if it's, you know, when or if. But not just it's not just throw it at the wall and see what sticks. That's very mm -hmm. yeah. It's, I mean, it's kind of like the greater collective evolutionary project is the mutation, and then everything else is in support of that. And we see that with the sort of um, principality of the third and fourth lines. It's between the three and the four that the mutation really is, and you know, all mm -hmm. those other lines to cushion it. In the same way that we need all this collective and tribal circuitry, essentially to support the mutation of the individual, mm -hmm. right? We need that that blood of that mutation to flow, whatever it takes to get there, that's what I experience with you. We have a comment from Jen, yeah. Joyful Projector. Four six roast, but you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, ouch. 
Yeah. I, I was going to say about the 622 is that that's, that's the one profile that um, I think Ross says with so many different gates, he says like the 622 is the one who's most liable to actually do nothing. Because once they get in their life, and, and I tell that to some of my 622 clients, as brutal as that sounds, because when I tell them, they go, I see that. Like, I see that that's how it can be. Because why would I leave the comfort of my naturalness after going through the bullshit of the third line and I'm up on the roof? I'm not going to leave the roof. There's no point for me to leave the roof. I'm comfortable up here. Maybe Saturn, you know, I have a job and I can make it through. I'm not going to deal with getting pulled off in the second line. Well, or it's they comfy. just yeah, or they just say yes. bring me um, bring the the soulmate up to the roof because that's what I was saying with my friend uh, who I was talking to, um, you know, about being six line in the forties, and I was saying, well, you know, the soulmate's really there for your fifties. They're like, really? I mean, it seems to me I got it made here. Like, why would I? Like, why don't they just? The, it was almost an attitude of the right person will just come up and the roof with me, but it's, it's impossible because that roof is your roof. It's your roof that you don't let anybody else in. And that's the that's the sixth line. The sixth line is going to its safe place. And the thing is it but gets like, really wouldn't two six lines be on the same name? Like be on the roof together? They'd be on their own They'd roof. They'd be on their own <laughs> roof. So they would still be on a roof. Like they totally can find it. I mean, here's the thing, you can have the most wonderful time with the sixth line, but again, like don't bring up money problems. Don't be like I need to borrow some money. Don't be like my ex is in town and there's an issue that came up. Like, you just cannot bring up anything. As long as you're like, hey, good news. Hey, we're doing this now. Hey, we're doing that. Like, you can meet on their level. And what that level is, is is a level of essentially being able to kind of watch and being able to experience not having to make that mistake yourself. The 4-6, you know, is an interesting one. I would say the 4-6 is most likely to have a best friend there are couples as best friends, and then eventually, in their 50s, when those couples break up, to marry their soulmate, who they've known for 20 years, who's married to their friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like that <laughs> level of kind of like, like, like you're married to someone, and you, you know a couple, and then after 20 years or whatever, they all broke up, and then you finally get to be with your soulmate, who was actually just your best friend for 20 years. Well, I was going to say, so many four sixes that I know, it's like they... With that fourth line, even on top of the six pickiness, the fourth line's picky too in its own way. And so many four sixes that I know, they're like, they get a partner, that's that's who they're with, period. That's like if they're lucky enough to find somebody that works on their fourth line, like, you know, that's that has the well, opportunity and, and, for them. Yeah, yeah, and they can find, I mean, the, the, the fourth line is always able to convert. There's no such thing as like a permanent friendship or a permanent romance. Like, for the fourth line... It really is the most, I mean, it is this kind of interesting voyeuristic <laughs> brotherhood, sisterhood. Like, it really is not looking for the intimacy in the same way that others are. It's looking for a different quality of connection, which, it, you know, I mean, again, it's kind of like that friendship, the deeper the friendship, the better the chance of that being converted to some romantic relationship later. And the stronger the fourth line's position, so to speak, and the more influence they have, the more desirable they are. So in a weird way, all of these kind of, all of these like tabloid magazines of so-and-so dating who and then gaining social clout mm -hmm. and then being like desirable to this other person dates them, that's the fourth line world of the not-self. Okay, that's the not-self fourth line world, is how that influence works and how influence is conferred mm -hmm. and how, you know, you, it's really, it's all about this, this moving up and moving up and kind of, uh, but, I mean, that's just, of course, as the not-self. I would say, as as the true self, there's a real understanding. I had a 4-6 ask me, um, you know, how do I know that my partner is in a good partnership with me and, and trustworthy and so on? So, well, they would talk to you like a friend. And, uh, and, and then, well, what does that mean? And, you know, I'm really thinking, because I know some, I have friends, and, you know, friends really do say to each other, like, oh, I'm just not really feeling it, I'm not really going to that well, I'm not really doing it great. They don't go, you know, you know, in this particular case, maybe, I hope it's not too private, I think it's anonymous enough. This person had told them, you know, I'm uh, finding myself and I'm looking inward to discover, uh, I think I'm going to be abstinent as I uh, turn inward to, you know, I'm like, that doesn't really sound like something they say to a friend. Didn't yeah. they just tell their friend, hey, I'm not really getting along very well with this person and we're having a rough time? Like, wouldn't that be what they would say to a friend? So just like a little hint for the four sixes, if your partner is talking to you in a really like tweety tweety way, that's like is making a whole reason why like they're distant from you. If they're really your friend, though, 
they'll be able to tell you, hey, I met someone else, I think they're really attractive, and I'm feeling this to them, and, you know, like the same way they would to a friend. I mean, that's hard for fourth lines to handle, but that builds, builds, builds. The fourth line needs that ability to actually maintain that deep friendship or to be able to, and it's really, it's, it's rough. I mean, that gets in the way of things. For the fourth line unconscious too, it can be a surprise to realize how comforting that is because, you know, as the not self, it's not comfortable to have someone that you like express any interest in anyone else. And that's a great segue back to 19 because 19, of course, is the root of I jealousy. Mean, mm -hmm. I was going to say, what is the four in 19? Because Oh, the team player. Indiv individual approach which attracts and accepts cooperation. That's the blue text? Um, yep. Yeah, I was, I was thinking as a fourth line with the 25 and the 6, that this is a really interesting situation I find myself in with, like, friendliness and mm. the 25, like, coolness that's there, and then the 6 where I'm like, let's hang out 24-7, and then, like, actually, I don't think I could not see you or talk to you for three weeks, and I'd be totally <laughs> fine. And then being very cavalier about that, and then yeah. that's some, and a lot of expectations really well, should don't enjoy that. Single definition also. I mean, I single love definition. that. Yeah. I, I, like to, I like to joke that we're all... We're all, um, you know, designed for relationship. Only some of us are equipped for it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I used to say only the split definitions are really designed for relationship. But then I was like, no, we're all interdependent. We all need each other. We're all designed for it. They're the ones who are equipped for it. We're the ones mm -hmm. who, like, lack the equipment and we have to kind of fill in the gaps. With, like, They're the ones who want one much. other person to just fully complete them in that way. <laughs> well, and we, can, and we can talk as much smack as we want about it. But I really, I, I always put it this way. So I, I get couples coming to me. The split deaths always want how to figure it out. Single deaths always want permission to break up. Or, you know, it's like, it's like across the board, they always want permission to just walk away and be like, oh, look, there's the thing that proves that you don't have to be with this person, see? But I never give it to them. I love that raw and partnership analysis. It's like the first thing people do when they get into human design is think to break up because they're immediately like, oh, my partner's this and this and this. Well, look at yourself. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean we're all... For all of this and this and this, like that's what it is. If you look at it, you start to see it's a mechanism. It's not. It's mechanical. It's not personal. It doesn't pick somebody to be a you know a jerk and then someone else. We're all kind of put through the science. So, but with this, it's funny because with single deaf, we really you know with each other we can have a relationship, but it's kind of it's a very unique thing. It's not like what a split deaf would consider as a relationship, which is fine. You know, it's our own thing. With the triple split, you have your own thing. With the, with the quad split. They have more like the split deaf, but with multiple people, I found. Like individual, one-on-one, -on -one, intense, close connections. Like you find the split deaf, but then, but then more of them. But what's interesting is that really it's only the, the split, not the quad or the triple or the single or the reflectors, who really knows how, or has the potential to know how to make it work. Um, I mean, there's a lot of negatives that can be said about that. We can make fun of it all we want, but they really do... You know, they are the ones who will compromise and, and, and so on. Will kind of, um, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's like, especially if you have a literal compromise, which is, of course, the jargon that we use for when one person has a hanging gate, like somebody has hanging gate 19, Mike has that whole channel, that would be a compromise where his whole channel kind of overrides that. The way I explain, you know, and that can be really hard, especially for single death. I feel like in a literal sense, the split definition is more willing to compromise because they're just... And it's, you're it's always compromising with yourself because yes. you have different parts going on. Right, you're split. Time. You're split. Yeah, so you're are, constantly... Are, like, are, are you the only split deaf person? Like you're split as well, okay. Both of you, yeah. It's like you're like constantly pulled in different <coughs> directions. Like, I know I want to do this, but I also have a, like, it's about to do this. Like. So you're kind of always, you're used to compromising because you're like, part of me wants to do this, but I'm just going to compromise and not appease that part yeah. and do the other side. That's such, I never actually heard it described that way, but that's such a funny thing that like, you're, you can practice it all the time. Yeah. That's what I was going to say, it's like you are constantly attracted to what you're not. And in the way you learn, oh, I can be what I'm not. Like, so I, I, I have to deal with conditioning. Right. You know, you're like you're the ones yeah. who are most pulled towards the patient, you have to figure that out. Well, and then mm -hmm. even for like a projector, I mean, you're oh, a generator, too. but of course, are in, yeah. are, in, are you MG or are you, yeah. I'm just right. Just generator, yeah. Generator club. That's us. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> no, but it's, no, we are. I mean, the regular generators, we are a different breed. I feel like the regular generators I, I are like the turtles. They're like I feel like y'all are rare, honestly. It's kind of strange. Like pure, pure G's. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's uh, it's it's just funny though. It's 
So with the split defs, it's kind of like it's. I, I love that human design doesn't give anybody like a free pass. It's like split def, kind of like gets to be like, well, why do I have this thing missing? I feel like I need all that, but then it's like, yeah, but you guys actually have what it takes. And also, it's a funny thing for me that I always thought the secret to a good relationship was something else. I didn't know it was literally just compromising. Like, that was, <laughs> I always thought, like, you know, you had to do something, like some magic trick or something. No, you just have to, like, actually give up your dreams in certain areas and give up your aspirations, give up your desires, yeah, give up all these... Compromise. You have to compromise. Yeah, you get to keep other dreams and other aspirations. You just don't have to keep all of them. And I was like, wait, I don't get to have all... All of them? Right? Like my just, way? All the time. It's, not, it's not just the highway or the highway for my entire life, always. It's amazing. So, well, I think 19 is a really interesting one because, in addition, I mean, it's, it's very multivalent. I know you, you know a lot about it, Mike. You have it also. And it's, it's you know, it's the root of the mystical way, which is the topic of your, your talk, Tato, back at the Human Design Conference in August 2021. And it's also, um, it's very, it's the tribal sexuality that goes up through the 3740, mm. right? Which is going to be all about, it's like those old couples that like just touch the shoulder or something and you just know, mm. you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, like that, that is like such a, yeah, the tribal support. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's yeah like, the, and it's weird how like, if you want to look at the dark edge of that, it's like the, it's a claiming also. If the like, this is, this is mine. I got this and, we're in a reciprocal, or we're exchanging with each other, and nobody else is going to exchange. This is my energy, and I'm there. Yeah. So there's there's some of that in there too. I can count on this, right? You can keep touching each other. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like the, the touch is a challenge. I know for me with a six, sometimes I'm like, if we, if this happens, if the touch is there, what is that? You know, I'm like, what's the claim being laid to my energy? <laughs> what is it going to be? Yeah. Yeah, which isn't the most productive way to think about it, but. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and you know that touch sensitivity goes all kinds of ways too because as a as a 1949 if you're touched in the wrong way I felt like as a projector if someone is not recognizing me and touching me at the same time that is just can destroy me in a moment I mm. like feel so so many 1949s have trauma around touch. oh um, it's sensitivity so I was going to say it seems like it's especially sensitive to bad touches or to being you know assaulted yeah perhaps. yeah which is also where justice, I mean, justice and ethic sort of come out of that. Oh, that's a based good point. On the sensitivity of like, that was not fair, that did not feel good, that was not right. what I wanted. How are we going to deal with that? What's yeah. the law, the value of mm -hmm. with that? I don't think that Foucault necessarily had that channel, but I think he might have been a student of it because I just, there's something very Foucaultian about it, where just about like, like so much of what he, his project was was looking at the historical times where, for instance, it became, like, we, we gained private space and personal space and my body mm -hmm. and a very personal sort of protective bubble around my space and all of these things emerged at a particular time in history mm -hmm. not that long ago, 500 yeah. years ago or something. And that's when like power was, yeah. was held on the body, too. That's when power started being like, my sphere of influence is here. Right, I'm you, not part of the populace. Right, mm -hmm. that's a really good point. Is and uh, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of this, this will maybe segue into cross the planning later if we get to it, or into global cycles, is looking at across the planning and realizing it. It really, it is an interesting cross, and in that it was the cross that brought in the nine centered beings. We don't actually even know what the first part of the cross of planning was doing in terms of activation, mm -hmm. but we know in terms of theme because it's the same sixty four gate matrix, whether you have three centers or five or seven or nine, mm -hmm. you know. We at least know that part of that theme was prove it to me. It's weird because you think 3740 is not personal autonomy, but there is something in it of at least defined ego of I don't want the mediated church version of God. I want the unmediated access. And I just prove it, you know, I'm going to use reason. I do think that the heart has something to do with uh, reason, and that, that was an interesting. But, it, but like you're saying, that 1949, which is really the guillotine mm -hmm. channel, the French Revolution guillotine, it's the ratchet wave that goes up and up and up and then cut. Mm -hmm. And, um, All right. yeah. I was thinking that that metaphor made me sort of like connect that, um, mm -hmm. thinking about that, I don't know, there's there's like a this, the slicing came to mind of like 
sectioning off. This is okay. This is not okay. This is what we do. This is what we don't do. Uh, it's sort of that deeper, out of the. Um, it's like a necessity of of two people being in a relationship, right? To figure out like the values that are there. But yeah, breaking those and compartmentalizing those, compartmentalizing ethic, what's correct, what's incorrect. You can see a lot of that happening in that project, which. Yeah, I don't know. There's just something about how you said that. that kind of oh, it's, that. well, this gets into some very deep areas, and, you know, um, I, I want to actually, or if, if you would do a, a favor, you read The Gates 19. Oh, we're getting some, uh, yeah. I will hide, we're getting some spam, our first spam, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. Click, so, the link. I'm Click the link. We're going to delete some of those. I'm reporting it. So for for unwanted, free. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my channel, I made it big time. It's okay, yeah, we'll report. Yeah. It's Hide it's user. Good. Okay, I have hid <laughs> I have hid the user, so we're good. But I was going to say, there's some very interesting areas to go in here, and maybe, Jenny, um, in a moment, you can read for us what Rob wrote in there, but, but not yeah. quite yet. Just in one second, read for us. There's something I think that's really interesting. So. <coughs> well, what I was going to say is... Um, just also in this kind of early, the 1949, and especially its connection in the mystical way to religion, uh, there's a really great book by the Thai called Theory of Religion. And Theory of Religion is written in 1970. It's an incredible book. It's all about how that religion began. It's very much a continuation of Totem and Taboo by Freud and also Fraser's Golden Bell about the priest kings and about how actually kings were often exogenous. They were often taken from other other peoples because they would be killed if anything went wrong, you know, and they would be sacrificed. And what was it to sacrifice? The scapegoat. But there's someone else in this area, um, Gerard, uh, the guy, yeah, uh, Rene Gerard, absolutely fantastic. He's a 5'1". He comes out every now and then in 5'1". But uh, he's, he came up with his theory of mimetic desire and he's a, a, a kind of anthropologist, cultural anthropologist who studies scapegoating. And so his whole thing was ritual sacrifice and murder and scapegoating and also the sacrifice of mammals. This goes back to the Thai where he said the sacrificial eating of the mammal was the first church. This was the beginning of religion. That this was with the moment that the animal that was made sacred and sacramentized, it's basically it's imbued with a uh, almost a personality crystal sort of meaning or symbolism on top of it because you know he really does get into the difference between the mammal and the human and he says mammals the, the lion is not the king of the jungle because kings have slaves and the lion is only a bigger wave crashing over smaller waves animals are in the world like water and water you know humans are the ones that are that we have the distance and the separation and the alienation and when we make an animal sacrifice, this is a sort of a, I mean, he basically, um, yeah, he, he, he does a really interesting theory where he kind of says that the sacrament is a kind of fundamental religious move because it's the fundamental conflation of a symbolic gesture with a physical act. And it reminds me almost of Hegel's very elusive comments, the spirit is a bone, which is a very mysterious statement, but it's kind of like this is the early way of the spiritual experience being the meaning of the physical act and this sort of coincidence of the two, the, the killing of, of the man taking the life. It's interesting to me too that the 1949 has bestowed a temporary ability to digest meat, temporary, of red meat. We can always digest birds, fish, reptiles. We'll continue to digest them. We'll be eating lizards Mad Max style a thousand years from now, but we will not be eating red meat. We will not, because red meat is on its way out, because we have a temporary ability to digest it, which has been kind of conferred on the seven-centered being and is fading out on the nine-centered. And we still kind of have it as a residual for our 1949 communal meeting. So that on. seems weird already, doesn't it? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the global cycle stuff, if we have energy, or we'll save it for next time. Would you like to read uh, yeah. a little further? Yeah. <clears throat> so, what well, Rob has here is... As the description for 1918. The ego circuit, the circuit of the material plane, is not to be underestimated, nor is it specifically mundane. This is the tribal circuitry where the keynote is support. 
This is the circuit of our communities, and there is your Bible. Which I think is interesting. But it's a notorious Um, this channel of synthesis is one of the three mystical channels, including 425 and 1020, and the only one that is potentially potentially aware and not strictly aware. This gate is the fuel of the sensitivity process. It is most mundane. It is hardly spiritual. It is potentially oversensitive and easily disturbed. The 19th gate fuels our social needs. It fuels the drive to make sure that and that there is a place in the community for this thing. It is not about wanting or needing someone specifically. It is the energy to support and the need to have support of the It is about having access and not being socially restricted. It is the force which drives all revolutions. At a biological level, it is about food. To avoid oversensitivity, it is always necessary for the have full refrigerator. Wow. That's just saying you have a full refrigerator. Is that is that true for you, Mike? Yeah, I have better luck when I drink this Wow. Wow. Okay. Something That's I really, cool. really liked was how, you know, because it's the gate pointing at 49, which is the gate of revolution, the force which drives all revolutions. And thinking about that, I, um, I was thinking about revolution today, um, and I always subscribe to the idea of like other revolutions we really only come from other inner revolutions. And you know, maintain is just like boiling it down to all like these, you know, basic needs. Like, right? So um, the force which drives with all revolutions is that you know, everyone needs to sure they have their basic needs met and they have their like, ability to you can see that even in the hexagram, the quarter of movement, it's the most material movement, because it's yang, yang, and then yin all the way up. Mm. It's as material as you can get in the quarter of movement. Right. So of course that would drive Is the quarter of movement the first quarter? Uh, no, it's the last quarter. Last quarter of movement. It's, yeah, the quarter stuff gets yeah, so... Yeah, because 19 was the last one. It yeah, gets exactly. so interesting. Oh, it's the last? Yeah, okay, I, well, mean, I, I assume that's why we're about to talk about cycles, right? Because tomorrow is initiation. Spiritually. Ah. But... Okay. What I was going to say to that is that I think thinking about the quarters bringing that in too is that the 19 is the, is the last gate, right, of the fourth quarter sort of prepping the way. And the first quarter has all of the solar plexus gates, of course, for, except for the, for the 36 or the 6, I think. But it has all the solar plexus gate. And, and Ra talks about how the solar plexus gates, why would they be in initiation and like mind, the quarter of mind? And that always confused me. And he said that it's because... Mind only develops when we are actually separate from something. So, like, why would I even have a thought about a plant if I didn't realize I was separate from it? Why would I? So, relationship mm-hmm. on the most basic level of like me and then it is the ground in which like consciousness emerges or, or self reference or any of those things mm-hmm. emerges. And so, when talking about the like the 19 moving into the 13 or moving in just to that first quarter, that's where. Um, that's where it feels like uh, it's like when so the transcendent or what's it yeah the transcendental sort of experience where you see something larger than you which happens really in the fifty one twenty five where you sort of step past that edge of your experience of self and then you expand into it push past that innocence but the nineteen is the um, the fuel to to sort of begin that process and when you're and it's the, the fuel that begins the process of relating to somebody closely, mm-hmm. right, in that touch. So the 1949 is always that place where you and the other begin and, and the connection between that. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know, I was just thinking about how it moving into initiation is the fuel that begins the process of differentiation, which allows relationship to even exist mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And eventually it gets to the transpersonal or the transcendent sort of idea, right? Where you're not just talking about relationship with person, but like God, universe, all that. But it starts purely because I'm separate from something. What emerges in that separateness? Mm. So I was thinking through that. Well, yeah, and that's the base too. I mean, obviously um, it's not yet into relationship, but it is, base two is, um, 
yeah, that's kind of what you're saying. It's like the, the principle of mind requires, uh, yeah, the ability to ornament and to decorate and to sort of be in clubs and be, have badges and have markings and to have categories and to have hierarchies. This is from last week. It's a little bit of an intense picture. Uh, very intense picture. This is, hey, this is, this is Mike's explanation. Remember, people were like, it's really confusing. Like, this wasn't clear, it's clear, really, really yeah. confusing. And then Mike was like, here you go. This will make it all well, make sense. I just wanted to quickly say what you were saying about like the between the third and fourth. This came to my mind because the, the Godhead has the similarity of the third and fourth line of the chant. Oh, right. Yes. Right? Whoa, good point. Whoa, oh, interesting. Good. So what is that? So a godhead in uh, any of the godheads in one way is defined by the four bottom lines, mm -hmm. but you could also see them individually as defined by the middle two lines, That's basically lines. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. they're kind of, each That's one a has yeah. a commonality. Yeah. And we were just talking earlier about the, that space between the third, third and fourth line being the interior space. Oh, Right? So that's connected to the godhead. Oh, that's nice. That's I do like that. I do like how in gate 54 you have... Uh, you have the devil at line one, and you have God at line six, and then human is at line four. Because at first I was like, well, isn't four past the edge? But actually the, the zero point of line four, you know, the base one of line four, the base one, tone one, color one of That's line four, is. <laughs> is the actual 50% point of that overall process. Mm -hmm. Starting at one, you get to the very end of line three, you're at 49.99999% through, and then you get to 50% is the beginning of uh, line four. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, because we always tend to kind of think, I, I was like, what is it, three and a half, like the midpoint or something? But no, it's actually the beginning of line four is right. the exact center slice of any division, mm -hmm. of any gate. So it's just a good point there. Yeah, yeah. this is this is it. It's uh, we, did a good, we got into a good talk of it last week, so I would just say watch last week's Human Design Catalyst, uh, if you're interested more about that. We got we got pretty good into it. We we got into it. Oh, yeah. So um, I also wanted to show. I don't know if I actually. This is actually our graphic. Thank you, Mike, for making this. Let's just can we go a clap for for Mike? We all appreciate this. Yeah, I, I, I legitimately LOL. We love. Yeah, we we LOL. And we anthropomorphism would be a very good topic. Just talking about this gate because I think this is where we yeah. see. The animism, and you put that ah. with a like, yeah, the little yeah. anthropomorphic person. The guy yeah. The yeah. And that's yeah. Trying to reconcile a relationship with something oh, that is not quite us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is again. Yeah, gate nineteen: neediness, mammals, quarters. Yeah. So okay, well, I do. I know it's we've, we've gone quite long in nineteen. I want to actually uh, jump over to one of the other topics that we've announced, and we don't have to dwell on it too much. We will go into this next week as a little preview. But there is um, this book, <laughs> which is quite an interesting book. Some of you might have seen this. Thanks, Angelica, for getting me into this. Uh, she's not here, but um, basically, you know, this has come up a number of times in my life. I know for a fact that you can study this for 20 years and be so asleep. Because actually, you met this guy, Mike. We had a we had a landlord. I lived briefly with my oh, yeah, first yeah. moved here, and our landlord was the angriest manifester in the world, the meanest, not self, <laughs> dead asleep, could not wake up. He was a shaman healer who makes money through psychically healing people and all this stuff. He goes to all these healing journeys, and he's an expert in this system. He spent twenty years on this system, and I can tell you for a fact, he's. Fully asleep, not a little. You can flick him, you would not wake up. Nothing yeah. can get through this guy. Nothing, nothing. So this does not wake you up. But what is it? But what is it then? What does it do for you? What does it do? It's an interesting thing. It's a great pitch so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't wake you up. But it, no, but it is a very specific. It's a very specific study. It's a very specific area. It's kind of like if you're a computer programmer, you don't use the same programming tools for everything. It has yeah. such an interesting history. Like you were telling me how it's been um, really this knowledge that's been passed on through through many people. And it just so happened to kind of land in this guy where he makes it look like a destiny book. Well, and apparently he stole everything or got everything from Sharon Jeffers' love and relationships. And so I'll have to t take a look at her. But um, I, I read the Florence Campbell, I forget hers. I read that book when I was a teenager. I mean, the thing is, what this is. 
first of all, we have a real curiosity here. So I'm, the, through it. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> okay, so it's what a real curiosity. It? So, so the curiosity is, Ra was not able to ask the voice almost anything in his one week, eight day experience. He asked the voice almost nothing, except, except about tarot, tarot about yeah. sequencing. Yeah. And, that, and what, it, what it was was about the tarot cards and the voice basically said, it's pointless, it's worthless. There's all these different sequences they used to be, you know, the information used to be encoded. I personally think, this is not from Rob, but it's my own hypothesis, that they went back to hieroglyphics and to Mesopotamian Sumerian. When I was a kid, I studied the Sumerians voraciously. I'm actually just, side note, completely shocked that now as an adult, just in the 20 years since I learned as a teenager and even younger kid about the Sumerians, we have now completely changed all of our understanding because everything I learned, the words that were translated were water, are now translated as semen and amniotic fluid. And like, mm. I, I learned a completely censored version of, I mean, it turns out the Sumerians weren't just, they were crazy. But no, <laughs> we'll talk Sumerian another time. But you know, they had this knowledge, they had the sequencing, and they, the mystics and the Egyptians had the sequencing, and on and on, and it eventually was lost, and it eventually deteriorated, sort of partly reemerging with tarot, somehow being, you know, but it's mostly God. Now, if you go into Ra's work on what's called incarnation sequencing, he talks about the sequences, the bundle and the weaver and the corner and the square, whatever they are, you know, these, these different, he has, there's basically, the, there's four sequences, four fundamental sequences. There's many more. And it was interesting to me that of the spreads in this book, it's only two of around 80 that are used. Because you could actually generate 80 different spreads or so or more. It'd be funny if it were 88. But um, in any case, what, what this is about is this information's mostly been lost. But, it, but enough of it's remained that you can get a feel for what it would be like if it was all fully revealed. Mm. Like, it's revealed enough. Like, you can tell in the beginning where he's like, if you're born close to midnight, change your, maybe look at the next card over because you don't really know why. You know, because the thing is, it's, you know, because for me, my first thought is, hey, I'm born September 25th, and yet there's a lot of four sixes, four ones born the same day as me, I'm a five one. Because this is based on the time, or the day, really. It's the day you are. So when but, you say, when you say yeah. sequences, do you just mean sequences and like archetypal sequences, sequences of different... I mean literal incarnations, your next life and your previous Those. life. Okay. I'm talking fractal lines, and so here's what's interesting with Ra's incarnation sequencing work. I'm base two, you're base two, Mike's base one. <coughs> he actually was able to reconstruct the base two sequence, because the base two sequence he had the formula for. And it's actually a real sequence through the gates, and it shows your previous life and your next life. And you could find the, the 12 two, and you could see what your previous one is and what your next one would be. And, you know, and they're all base two, because every single one's a base two. It enters an exit, or you know, it enters on a, I don't know what an exit time, but it enters on a base two, and then you die, and it goes the next one, and phase two, and you die, and the next one. And so basically, it's continually um, pinging you through this sequence. Now, Mike is on his own base one sequence. He's going to base one, to base one, to base one, to base one, to base one. Uh, what, what, what card are you? I'm like King's Diamond. Oh, okay. You're like, the yeah, I'm a king. business person. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> so, so, but what's interesting is we know that base one has no relationship to base two. Well, what Ma hypothesized was that you would see no gates in common between the two. The base one and the base two sequence would have opposite gates. Base three and base four would have a combination of those gates, and those would be the interlinking sequences. So this is very, very esoteric. Basically, the, my point in bringing this up is there is a whole area that Ra never really got to, which is past lives and incarnation. People are always fascinated by this. And the real question that they always have is about past life. You know, who is this person to me and what is our relationship? Now, what's interesting about this, and, and then we'll kind of, I, I want to actually mention a comment. Um, yeah, and I want to mention a, a comment, and thank you so much, Marcus. He's, he's very knowledgeable about this, and he's been saying some good info. But um, what I'll say is, just at the basic level, you have three tools. This gives you a karma wheel, which is interesting because the karma is only one part of it. The karma, which I like, just like in human design, karma is the left angles, you know, we have kind of a, we have different processes, like not everything is karma. This is the karma wheel. Now what's interesting is you can look up your card 
And you can see how far away somebody is from you on this karma wheel. If they're next to you, they are karmic. They're next to each other. You're next to each other in real life, and you're next to each other here. Now, if you're one over your karma cousins, because you both share the same karma cousins, you are. It's called KRMC in here. And he has codes. And basically, and you can see that it goes in a certain direction. So one person will always be karmically giving to you, one will always be karmically taking from you. And so this is the karma wheel. And at the level of the karma wheel, I like this a lot. I mean, I, I like the fact that, that there is a sort of karmic analysis going on. Now, there's two other things. There are two different spreads out of the 80 or how many spreads there are. There's the life spread and the spiritual spread. I like this a lot, too. Why? Because the spiritual spread refers to the personality crystal that, in, in my view, anyway, that gets to come back every time. Every incarnation, you have the same personality crystal. Over and over and over, you die, your personality crystal goes to the next life. Mm -hmm. Your design crystal, your unconscious... The other guy, the other thing that's there that you have to live with, the consciousness of the critter, that's a use once and dispose of. That crystal, I mean, to be saved in the Earth's mantle for who knows what purpose down the road. But that's only used once. So really, the human has two souls. The ancient Phoenicians had it right when they said that they would do two funerals, one for the, one for the spirit, one for the soul. One for the eternal soul, one for the temporal soul. It's just like that for humans. We have a personality crystal that keeps coming back. With a design crystal that's only here once for this body and then gone. Well, similarly, you have two spreads. So, I'm a queen of hearts. You can figure out what you are. I am something to you spiritually, mm -hmm. in the sense that every time I, you know, you come back, and every time I come back, I have this relationship to you, mm -hmm. that eternal soul personality relationship. Mm -hmm. But I also have the life relationship just to you in this life. Mm -hmm. Because there's a life spread. So you find your card there, then you find where I am in the life spread. And the way that the relationship is, is the most basic it could possibly be. It's the most fundamental. I do believe it is just as real in that sense as human design, because the fundamental relationship of the distance of the cards goes, you are the sun, the next card to you is the moon. The next card to you is the Mercury. The next is the Venus, the next is Mars, all the way up to Pluto now. And it's interesting, this is too much for today, so I won't make it, maybe next week we can. I've talked before about how there are certain transitional mysticisms like the Enneagram, mm -hmm. where it's really beautiful how the Enneagram actually works perfectly with the seven planets, the seven centered, and where it, it actually, if you were to, it actually only goes to seven. It doesn't even have Enneagram eight or nine until we're through the nine centered, because mm -hmm. the eight or nine are the, are the it, it, it only, it misses the four and five, rather. Oh. It misses the four and five. Like, just to the short version of it for like Enneagram fans out there, if you look at the traditional seven-centered rulerships over the numbers, starting in Aries, and just going Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and so on, you get Enneagram 8, 9, 1, 2, 3, Whoa. which is a 5. And then you go, you go to the next one. After Leo, you go to Virgo. You go back to 1. That's Mercury again. And then it's 1, 9, 8, 7, mm. 6, up to Saturn. Mm. And then it goes 6, 7. So what's interesting is it actually goes, it goes eight nine one two three and then one nine eight seven six six seven, mm -hmm. and that's because the enneagram was really like ready to be filled in as a nine centered as we emerged into it, where then it stops going seven six six seven. You know what I mean? I, I'm saying as you follow that that would be um, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, mm -hmm. traditional rulerships. That's going to be Enneagram 6, Saturn, Enneagram 7, Jupiter, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it, it goes into this, or sorry, 7, 6, 6, 7. Yeah, it goes Jupiter, Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter. So anyway, it's a long-winded way of saying that basically, I believe that these mystical systems emerge with almost placeholders ready for the new planetary archetype to, to step into. It's almost like they're scaffolding. So Enneagram did function before 1781, mm -hmm. just like... Love cards, or what is really just tarot, or I mean, it shouldn't be called love cards. You shouldn't get the, uh, you know, the copyright on this because what it really is is like the tarot and all of these things. I mean, any of these cards, they had a certain quality before 1781, and that certain quality ended at Saturn, and there were no relationships beyond Saturn. It probably just went up to Saturn and then went back down, just like any of them. It just goes up and then it starts counting back down. But then, as soon as Uranus entered the picture, as soon as Neptune, as soon as Pluto entered the picture those like placeholders were already ready to be occupied by the new planetary archetypes. And people were, so 
I guess what I'm saying is if there wasn't any of them for before 1781, they were jovial. Mm. They weren't sad. You know? yes. If there was an Enneagram 5, they were Saturnian. They weren't Uranian. Because mm. there, nothing was Uranian before 1781. I'm That's just say, isn't that when Romanticism started, too? Isn't that around? Oh, absolutely. Romanticism I'm just thinking of the 4, too. In that. Oh. It's such an incredible part of it. So. That's really interesting. Well, I just want to really quickly, if, any comments first? And then I want to read Marcus's uh, comments. And, and then we can wrap up love cards. We'll go into it more next week. Maybe we'll do our, do our love cards. <laughs> but... But that would be fine. But I, I don't want to exhaust anyone with it. But I, I okay, I'll read Marcus's comments. Hi, Linnell. Thanks for joining in. So Marcus is saying, Cards of Destiny is mathematical, not by chance, like tarot. Well, you're absolutely right. But what I'm saying is not divination use of tarot, but there's actually somebody who's done the tarot Enneagram. What they found is, so I'm really a big believer in tarot birth cards. It is insanely accurate. When you look at what you are, I am a son Magus, I'm a Magus Sun Wheel, or Magus Wheel Sun, whatever you want to call it. So have you heard about that new system that um, a guy named Manix Ibar made, and it's tarot based on the backing of human design, birth card tarot. I'm going to pull it out. Oh, I have it. This is perfect. Tarot is very tarot stuff. This is like the entire He's kind of the, uh, he was like the reader to Jenna Zoe. He's known Jenna Zoe for a long time, but I knew him through my mentor. I don't, I've never met him, but he yeah. just put out an entire new system like a year ago um, that I looked at once and was like, no, but now what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm well, like, I mean, the thing is, the systems, I mean, the systems don't have to be useful in the way human design is useful. It can be useful. Here's what I like about love cards slash cards of destiny. I guess we can call them cards of destiny. And what I oh, and then and also Marcus says yes, these oracle systems can be super empowering in my in my experience. Yeah, it's interesting that just like each chain can be used for divination, but also as a whole mathematical system. Tarot can be used for divination, but it's also the system. Same with this, and there are these magic squares and these spreads. I think the use of it is seeing what somebody is to you, what role they play in your life, and that's what's really interesting. Is that for instance, all the cards in the entire deck, music from the hearts. I have the lowest score, if you believe Robert Camp's scoring mechanism, <laughs> with the Four of Clubs. The Four of Clubs also happens to be my design date. Oh, wow. Cool. And the Four of Clubs also happens to be my dad's <laughs> birth date, and the birthday of two of my business partners, who I had some of the most failure with, oh, wow. and the birth date of John David Ebert, <laughs> who has made it, you know, has tried to exact vengeance. That was a kind of stuff. And yeah. the birthday, yeah. but some interesting ones too. Both Morgan and Ryan. Not, oh, nothing exactly. bad with them. Yeah. <laughs> Although the album I did, or the music I did with Morgan, completely never released. Mm -hmm. He banned it. The only time I've ever worked on music with somebody who then forbade me from releasing it. Wow. So, I mean, and it is my, it, they are Saturn to me as their primary relationship. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there is something to birth cards when yeah. you start to see. And also, what does it mean that to have a design date that is Saturn to you? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My, my own unconscious is Saturn to me. I live with remember the four. Remember when o'clock. you met Saturn in a dream? Do you remember? I, I have had a wait, which 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 yeah. time? I know I do remember. I do remember. Wow. Oh yeah, I remember the full. Yeah, I do remember that. Like the Dark Souls. And he said, "What do you have to teach me?" Yeah, I was like poking him in the chest. I was like really like I was getting in his face. <laughs> that was my unconscious. That's me. that's that's my design, right? So I mean, it is interesting to like to actually be able to do a birth card of your design date and see like, except that everyone, I guess actually not everyone is the same though because depending on you're born. You know, I'm a queen of hearts with the four of clubs design. Some have the three of clubs, some have the five of clubs. Those are both great. Those mm -hmm. both have all sorts of, like, three of clubs is like Venus to me or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, some, some queen of hearts are just born a little bit different time. Their design date falls in a different mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. right? Right. right? It really right. does because yeah. of, uh, of the way that the 88 degrees works. Right. It's not based on 24-hour increments. Thank goodness for that. So, yeah, so there is a nice variety. Yeah, thank goodness that it's... At least a little bit of variety in the system. But, uh, oh, Marcus, Aries, Six of Diamonds. Oh, I know Six of Diamonds very well. We were just, that's the March 17th, so I was talking about. Mm -hmm. wow. I have so many that Six of Diamonds nice, in my life. March 17th is my, wait. You're March 16th to design March date. Five, yeah, hers is Five of Diamonds. So Did you move again? This is day or two after that, right? The 15th. Yeah, I'm the 14th. So. Oh, and if you want to check, then. Oh, so <laughs> we, we don't even have to check, though. I know. You're uh, the Ace of Diamonds. Too. But it doesn't work like that. It doesn't? 
Oh, a lot of them do. Well, you can check. Let's ask. Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll check. Yeah, because they're so, like they jump seats. So I just want to jump back for a minute. So starting it off, uh, Marcus did say, if you like Robert Camp, you'll prefer Sharon Jeffers' love and relationships. She was the teacher of Camp. Then Marcus goes on to say, Camp, ironically, is a reflector who refuses mm. to see anything of himself in human design. Wow. <laughs> Sad. Oh. So... Um, yeah, Marcus said he's trained in the system and studying HD2. Well, this is this is wonderful. I would love to connect and for this Marcus, feel free to message me outside of this on any of the usual channels. Shine, baby, shine. My father is my Saturn card. Yeah, mine too. I, I'm right with you. And my sister and mom are my karma cards. Joyful projector. I have no idea how to check mine. But, um, no, you can also, it's like 20 bucks. Bookfinder.com, I'm not affiliated with them. It's the best to find in books. First line to find. Hey, I, I used it the other day. What would you find? Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I want to say it. Oh, but did you buy anything or no? Did you make a purchase? Yes. Okay, so it worked. Yeah. It worked. Okay, that, that's it, all it I need to know. Available. That's all I need to know. Okay, it's just from Amazon, but at least... Yeah. No, I said it was from Miss of Avalon. <laughs> oh, the Mist <laughs> of Avalon. Oh, I thought you said it took the Amazon. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, but I found it for three bucks. Oh, hell yeah. Oh. Yeah, see, you can get, see, Book Finder, you get some cheap books. I like, I look for stuff I already have on there, so it's an like extra copy. It's a good uh, design. Okay, well, we will go more into Love Cards next week. I think that, that we've, it's a good little teaser, taster for it. Um, do we want to do anything else before we wrap it up? We've got a pretty good 1949. I feel like Global Cycles we should talk about another time, too. That will be, we did a little teaser of it in the, in the prelim, but I think, you know, let's we'll just keep it going next week unless anyone else has anything to share. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking about quarter of initiation, what that means. Well, but maybe you could goal. actually close it out for a second, because I remember no, I did want to... No, let's do it next week, really? we'll, okay. we'll officially be in it. Notice how few of us do. What's, what's just, the quarter of mutation though, too? Because that's a confusing. I mean, it's got what? It's all the root, a huge amount of root gates. Mm, good point. Which is weird, but it's preparing for death. I love the. I reference Mara's talk on Hades a lot, and I've listened to other ones, but that's a fun yeah, idea. I want me. all the Godhead info. Oh, the Godheads are so good. So here, I'll just show this crazy. Uh, Crazy picture again for everybody. Ah, Godheads. This is them. <laughs> I'm Pavarti. What? You're pa oh. Which is not as exciting um, as some of the other ones, but still so very cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What's your, is it 15? No, no, it's not 15. 15 is Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I assume? No, I just remember you have 15 years old. Yeah. So you're, are you a tourist then? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so as far as the, the Godheads, though, I love Hades because Hades is all about, is it the, the very middle of mutation? Or is it it's the beginning of mutation? Okay, so it is the beginning. It's the beginning of each quarter is the middle of something, though, right? It's like the middle of... Oh, the middle of the season. The middle of the season. Tomorrow is the height of winter. Okay, so that's a really good point, is that... For a northern. The start, of a, the start of a quarter is the middle of a season. And so the start of the quarter of mutation, which is gate one, and then the gates after it, I guess. Mm -hmm. It has 34, 14, 43. Mm -hmm. I don't know in that order. But anyway, it's a really nice way of looking at mutation with the way Rob describes it. He says, okay, this wheel is trying to make sure that you're on this ride and you're on this, it's trying to just, you know, it's like you, you step in, you step off. Like it's trying to make sure you're all set up. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we get to the point of duality you have kids, you fulfilled your genetic imperative. At this point, mm -hmm. you're off the hook. What do you do? You start the quarter of mutation, which is preparing for death. Mm -hmm. He said, nothing prepares you for death more than efficiency. You get to 43, mm -hmm. you get efficiency. Mm -hmm. You get, um, it's efficiently getting you ready to go into the grave, just efficiently, just day in, day out. The less you change your routine, the faster it goes by. And all mm -hmm. those days with the same routine just collapse into one day, and then you're dead. And so it's like, once you've fulfilled your purpose, let's just make it as quick as possible to get through all the rest of those years so that mm -hmm. the last year, the second half of those years go by in a snap compared to the first. Mm -hmm. It's really not a very uh, optimistic outlook on any of that. But, um, well, and I, to, to bring the hopeful to it, I, I just think also even in the, like, the, there's a bunch of different schools that talk about the four directions in a, in a developmental model, right, of 
you know, like either birth or you know, young adulthood and whichever whichever direction. But mm -hmm. the north it, or would this one necessarily be north? But it's, but it's different. It's like elderhood though. It's, but it's, it's elderhood. Yeah, it's preparing so, for the and and but then the elder has a huge responsibility to provide information that supports the next mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. So and, and that's you know like thinking of just the keepers of the wheel as being the last godhead in that like all of those gates again sort of preparing everybody yeah. else and being like and then thirteen I'm just a whisper in your ear and I'm like gone you know mm -hmm. oh that's interesting yeah. mm -hmm. well what's interesting with that too is like it's, like it feels like it's collecting everything mm -hmm. um, and then with thirteen it's it's ready to <clears throat> kind of bring it into a story. I always think of storytelling. Yeah. Well, it'll be a perfect uh, topic next week when we're going to go <laughs> cycles, where the key is 60 on one, the key for understanding um, the history of, you know, our own personal history. And what is, what is after? Is it a 32? Or is it a 32? I wonder if you put this in here to piss me off. That is, it says, it says, king of clubs make distinctions in their life about everything. And then it goes on to say that if some key is uncrossed or some capital I with seraphs is undotted, <laughs> why would it be dotted? <laughs> yeah, capital I should yeah. be undotted. Ah, at least if you're going to complain about it, get it right. Jeez. <laughs> oh. Get it right with your companion. Also, I just realized it, it's it's forty nine that comes after thirteen. I love that because nineteen is like the approach to need. Thirteen is like okay, if we make the move right now, we gotta listen. We just gotta pay attention to history a little bit. And then forty nine is okay. Like let's see what needs to be sort of lifted up and re and then after that's 30. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then for next week we'll talk about how the key uh, to gate thirteen is. It's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's going back to 54. I just checked, it was 54. That's what I was thinking, which is such a funny, just a, real quick as a little bit of a teaser for next week. Gate 13 is our lock of how we understand history, the stories we tell about ourselves. Now we're in the 1601 occult knowledge, so we can actually understand our collective history through the lens of occult knowledge. Mm -hmm. We actually get the whole story through the lens of occult cycles and mysticism and all of this. When it moves into 54.6, we're going to get a very different version of history. The history that's going to be taught to students is going to be the history of ambitions. Yeah, it's going to be the history of the one hit wonder, who are, of the TikTok star. It's going to be the history of the anyone can do it, Route 54. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, for those who don't know, that's the, yeah, uh, Marrying Maiden, the kind of uh, the concubine who becomes the princess. So that will be, in the future, we're not going to really care about the mystical understandings of our past, mm. we're going to see the past in terms of ambition. Mm. Who is ambitious? Mm. So. Mm. All right, well, till next week. Thanks for tuning in, all. Thank you so much. Shout out to Jen. Shout out to Marcus in New York. Shout out to Linnell. Shout out to Shine Baby Shine. Thanks for tuning in. Shout out to Spam Bot. Shout out to Spambot, which is, is back again. I'm going to just move it and remove it. It's persistent. I'm removing them all. I'm just going, yeah, I'm doing it. But. All right, everybody. Wow, it really got a lot in there. Uh, Linnell, hey, I'm enjoying your Insta post, Joyful Projector. We enjoy them as well. They're oh, yeah. wonderful. Great. They're good fans, so. I've seen her before, too. Yeah, lots of good, lots of good stuff. Okay, thanks for tuning in, all. See ya. Bye.